Liberty Me, I am Kyle Platt, here with Dr. Gary Gallus, author of Faulty Premises, Faulty Policies, the new ebook on Liberty Me. Thank you so much for being here, Gary. It's good to be here. Now, Gary is also professor of economics at Pepperdine University. And I bring that up not only because later on I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, economics, but because this is a book on rhetoric, is it not? Well, it is in many ways rhetoric because when you look at false premises, the false premises that base policy, a lot of them are basically rhetorical confusions. Sure. I so, mean, when I when I watch politicians, there are oftentimes I, I have a little background <clears throat> in uh, rhetorical analysis and, and um, narrative analysis. And when I listen to or actually most of the time when you see a text of a political speech, when you really boil it down, what they're saying is absolutely nothing. It's just, like you said, rhetorical confusion. But yeah, go ahead. I actually had to do that as a, a homework assignment in a logic class as an undergraduate. Pick a political speech, use whatever logical rules that cancel out mutual consistencies to see how close to the null set you can get. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely. <laughs> but anyway, so in my book, what I found, and this is from 30 years of watching public policy, sure. that logic means that if your premises are right, then the conclusions necessarily follow. But there's no, nothing that saves you if your premises are wrong. So I basically organized it into three different groups of faulty premises. And as you mentioned, rhetoric is involved in two of the three. There is what I grouped into basically misunderstandings about the nature of markets and government. Where, For instance, where they use you know, survival of the fittest rhetoric to describe markets, which is not that at all. But you know, if you accept that as an underlying premise, markets will always look bad. So it's basically you just don't understand that you know, markets are not about competition. It is competition to better cooperate. So when they say co cooperation and they imply government versus competition, which requires evil, mean, competitive people, the rhetoric makes it, markets look bad, but it's also misleading. The second one was from the nature of um, language itself. So for instance, the word me is a political weasel word. I can say we as Americans pay social security taxes and we as Americans get the benefit, but I change who the we were in the middle. Right, because young people get screwed to the tune of trillions of dollars, and old people made out to that. So when you use the word "we," you just hid the massive redistribution of stuff. It's sort of like in Keynesian analysis in macro, they look at it. There's a category called net taxes, taxes minus transfers. What if I tax you more heavily to transfer to me? When you aggregate it all together, the transfer disappears. <laughs> right, so it's not in the data, and yet. I have undermined your incentives and mine in the process. So th that's that issue. So the words like me and need and must, all of those are misrepresentations of what actually happens that rhetorically make you misunderstand economics. The third basic category was measurement, though. There's measurements, because you mentioned Piketty's book to me beforehand. Well, that's in the measurement category. <laughs> but the idea is that when you look at a typical public policy, there are multiple false premises built into the argument. But if only one false premise can make an argument false in the sense of it's not true, even though it's valid, what if you get three or four false premises? The odds that they're actually doing good analysis fall to near zero, and the odds that they're lying to you either accidentally or on purpose go up near 100%. Sure. Let's work through this a little bit. Um, what is a good example or a couple of funny examples that you can think of or maybe some that you use in the book itself, of recent or maybe not so recent examples of these uh, rhetorical mind games of politicians, and how well, can we break this up and show it for what it is? Well, um, you hear all the time the word greed, but it's never applied consistently. Greed basically means you want more of something. When I want it, then it's need, right? Well, if you match up need versus greed, you're always going to have need win. Well, what does it mean to say need? Say you. You need something. If it's true and you have resources and you really need it, wouldn't you buy it yourself? Sure. Okay. Do you need to say the word need if you're just going to buy it yourself? It's more, I think, to convince others that what you're doing isn't greed. Well, it's not greed, but it also sneaks in something else. Okay. Because you need it, you shouldn't be required to pay for it, oh. which then 
realize that somebody else should be made to pay for it because you need it, right? But that's the idea is that we phrase it as need versus greed, both of which are weasel words. Because if you want more, you never say it's greed. You always say it's justified. It's only when somebody else wants more, I say what I wouldn't be true. So if you're a union member trying to go on strike, you're never greedy. <laughs> never. It's just those evil corporate. Somehow they're greedy and you're not. Well, no. If greed is what's going on, you're greedy and they're greedy. There's no advantage to you over them except by cheating rhetorically. Or, you know, think of the words like gouging. Now, what does that mean? It's just a way for the government to throw a, a word that makes people look bad, right? Because there's no clear definition of what gouging is other than I don't like it and I'm a politician. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, it, yeah, it seems to me that things like necessary goods, and when, you, when we say necessary, it implies a need. You talk yes, about- Yes, implies you shouldn't be made to pay for it. Right, because right. Because if you really need it, and we're humanitarians, right? We need to provide it. Well, they just stop the story before they ask, okay, who is going to be mandated to provide the resources against their will and in violation of their property to meet your need? All right. Well, there's a, there's an interesting dissonance there as far as um, necessary goods go, because you know what what do what does a person need to survive? Well, honestly, all you really need is nutrients, uh, food, and water, <clears throat> but. Now, what people say is that necessary goods are food, water, um, housing, health care. Some people say gas, too. But wait, what about gas? You know, lefty politicians Let say... Let broccoli. They'll get plenty of gas. <laughs> well, yeah. But lefty politicians say that gas is, uh, is a bad thing and that we should tax gas so that people can move on to, uh, to other sources of energy. Well, wait a second. <laughs> I mean, if, if gas is a necessary good, then why are we going to price it out of the range where most people can buy it? Well, part of the issue, and you see this, by the way, you see this echoed in the EU constitution of a few years back, the things you're guaranteed to have because of the government. Of course, the, the silly thing is, if you look at that list, how many of those things didn't exist a century ago? I the don't know. They, Which ever, all of them. Basically, except for food, I mean, housing isn't the same. Cell phones are a need. You know, bu you know, buses, cars, they exist. Did society have the resources to make those things guaranteed to everybody ever in human history? No. no. <laughs> well, if you can't do it, it can't make sense. To say something is necessary that can't be done is simply a logical contradiction, and you should stop there. Well, so they say you have a right to something that can't be done, but damn it, we're going to try to provide them, which basically means you impoverish society and steal from everybody else. What an accomplishment. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what governments do. Uh, <laughs> I think this is really cool, though, because libertarians are always asking, how can I convince people to be libertarian? They're always asking, you know, why does everyone think that we have to be Democrats or Republicans or we have to vote a certain way in order to, to create progress? But nobody really seems to have an answer. But I think you might. If, well, if we can show people that these speeches, that the words of politicians mean nothing and nothing is promised in, in, practical, in the practical sense, I, I think that might be the best argument we have. It may be as good as we can do. But by the way, I want you to know, you know who made up the term weasel word? What? Friedrich Hayek. Oh, nice. I think it was in the, I think it was one, one of the Constitution of Liberty, the three book series. I think he mentioned, I came across it in my reading. I said, yeah, I mean, I thought I had originate the idea of that as the word. But no, Hayek did. Or, you know, it's really sort of recognizing that part of it, like Hayek did, and combining it with, Ludwig von Mises approach, which I always respect, said you're never going to convince somebody that their value judgments are wrong. Never. And as you get older, it gets hard to eat. Right? So what you do is this. The only hope you have for reducing disagreement is to say, okay, you say you value these things. I'm going to take you at your word. And then you have to show them that the policies that they're supporting do not achieve what they want to do. Because then you basically say, if you're serious about doing that good and not so full of ego, then we can narrow our disagreements and say, you know what, if it doesn't work, I'm not for it anymore. That's really all you can do is to show them that it doesn't work to advance the arguments that they portray as believing. That's about as good as you can do. The problem is, I tell my wife, our reason is at the service of our self-interest. You know, theoretically, if you're doing this from a theoretical perspective, you should decide what do I believe 
derive conclusions from what I believe, and then act accordingly. What happens is we start because we have certain self-interest. So then we are convince ourselves that whatever we did made sense. And then we embellish it when we talk to others. As I tell my students, by the time you talk to me, you may have lied twice. You <laughs> once to yourself to make it sound better than it did, and then you embellished it to your friends. That's why economists are cynics. You know, you might want me to believe you because you say something, but what you say and what you do are so often inconsistent. But when you do something, you tell the truth. When you spend $10 to buy something, you're saying, I really believe it's worth more than $10. If you just say it and don't do it, we have no idea what you mean. Wow, that's very true. <laughs> but I mean, that's from, I mean, there is the hope that people can be convinced by reason. But that really depends on them being open to reason and really believing in the end result they say they're for. But it's not mixed in with all their self-interest along the way. See, it's usually in their self-interest. This is like the labor union stuff. They say we want higher minimum wage to help the little guy. Well, it actually harms most of the little guys. But it unambiguously benefits union workers, right? So they dress it up like I'm caring about them. But what they're really doing is raising the price of a substitute to union work which increases the demand for union workers that makes them richer, right? So they say it's about them and it's really about me. Well, how can you get past that, but it's really about me stage? If that's what makes them liberal, there is no way of reaching them because they're the gatekeeper to what they're willing to listen to. Well, or you can just convince people that we're all working in self-interest and greed is an abstract idea that almost doesn't exist. I mean- well, the problem with greed is that it's using the wrong word. I mean, it's, it's intentionally using a weasel word when you could be clear. Yeah. Economists don't talk about greed. We talk about self-interest, where greed is consistent with self. That is, someone can be both selfish, greedy, and self-interested, but they can be self-interested without being selfish and greedy, right? So they're intentionally introduced language to confuse things. So in the most common example, the counter example that you'd hear in an econ class is Mother Teresa. What she did with her Nobel Prize money was to build a leprosarium, a hospital for lepers. Was that greedy? No. Did it advance something she cared about? Yes. That's all economists mean is your self-interest. There's something you care, some end you care about advancing. That's all we need to know. To say it's greedy is to say, in effect, the end you want to advance, I have decided is unworthy. I get to decide which ends you have that it should be done. Talk about a statist mindset. Sure. But that's, that's the issue. I mean, in, in fact, who is it? There's a guy at, uh, I'm trying to remember his name. There's uh, somebody at Berkeley, a professor. I'm trying to remember who put out a book. He's a uh, Lakoff, L A K O F F, I think is his name. Hmm. He put out a book, you know, saying, you know, make sure you use this paternalistic language, right? We're taking care of, because it sounds better, right? And I, one of the articles, one of the articles that's in Faulty Premises, Faulty Policies, is about how the analogy to paternalism breaks down for government. Because first of all, your parents, we all said they have some power to help do stuff because you're not relevant. Well, to do something for a child is different from for someone else to do something to an adult, right? It's not the same to say the government's taking care of adults and parents are taking care of children. Parents know you better than the government knows you. Parents care about you more than the government cares about you. They can be more flexible in what they do and learn than government can do. And they use resources they had to get others to give them voluntarily. Well, there's about a half dozen places that logic breaks down. But it's you don't use the logic. It just sucks you in by making you feel better. I mean, this is a Tom Sowell, I think, once said the history of the last hundred years has been replacing what worked with what sounded good. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> No, he was a smart guy. Reading, in fact, I had to design a class for someone at the public policy school who, after they were in, was diagnosed where he basically couldn't handle either diagrams or math. Well, how do you do stuff for public policy if you can't do either? So I, I was asked to design a class for someone who couldn't do either of them that really still gave them some insight into policy and those things. And I think I sick four of the books I signed were from Tom Soule. Right. And I had some other some classic uh, libertarian stuff in there and some other. So but it was there's useful stuff. Tom Sowell is a very good writer. He's a little more conservative, I'd say, than most libertarians. Um, Walter Williams is a little closer in that regard. But uh, anyway, sure. definitely get on to liberty.me and check out faulty premises, faulty 
Policies by Dr. Gary Gallus. And Gary, and check, I very much appreciate you coming on. Check out the picture on the back. You'll see a picture of my handsome dog, too. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gary. Well, nice to talk to you. And you as well. Have a great day. Thank you.